In the Great Commission, Jesus instructed His apostles to go into all the world and make disciples. How do you make a disciple? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? How do you know if you are living as a disciple? Tonight on GBN Live, we will be discussing what does it mean to be a disciple. Join Barry Gilry Jr. and myself as we sit down with Mike Hickson to discuss this relevant topic on GBN Live. Live from the Gospel Broadcasting Network located just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. Be a part of today's episode by calling in or interacting with us through Facebook. Now from Olive Branch, Mississippi, it's GBN Live. Good evening and welcome again to GBN Live. I'm Mike Hickson, so glad to be with you tonight. We have a great program tonight. What does it mean to be a disciple? And we're going to be talking about discipleship. And I hope you'll stay with us for the next hour. We're very appreciative tonight to have Barry Gilreath with us. And Barry's been with us on many occasions. And as a matter of fact, his dad was uh, really, I guess, the, the genesis behind GBN. And uh, a lot of fond memories of, of, of your dad. And appreciate him and your mom and the great influence that they they have been through the years. Well, thank you, Mike. It's good to be here as usual. I always enjoy coming and visiting uh, GBN, and to be on your program tonight is certainly a great honor. Thank you for the invitation. Glad to have you. And also, Jameson Stewart. And Jameson is a recent graduate of MSOP, and he is preaching in Mississippi. And Jameson, we're so glad to have you with us tonight. Yes, sir. Good to be here. We're going to be taking your calls. If you'd like to call us tonight, 888 805-3390. Feel free to email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. We would love to take your calls. It may be that you have a comment tonight about our program. And again, please feel free to call us or write us. We'd love to hear from you. As we begin our program with regard to discipleship, I guess maybe it would be good to, first of all, define what it means to be a disciple. And of course, in this context, we're talking about being a disciple of Jesus. And so what do we mean when we say discipleship? A disciple is a learner. A disciple is a follower. Uh, a disciple says, there is my master. Uh, there's Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus in everything he did or everything he teaches. And so a, a disciple is someone who is always uh, in the state of, of learning. Um, you know, that, that word disciple is, is found over 250 times in the New Testament. And, you know, as we think about that uh, and the importance of that, I think it just emphasizes the fact that this is an important subject that we're addressing tonight. If God mentions something one time in the Word of God, it's important. Sure. But a concept that is mentioned some 250 times, uh, that's something that, that God wants us to take note of. Yeah, I think so. And, and we talk about Jesus being the master teacher. I can't help but think about what John wrote in John chapter 7, verse 46. He said, no man ever spoke like this man. And his teaching was incomparable. And of course, Peter in John chapter 6, when many of the disciples were leaving the Lord, and the Lord then asked the twelve, will you also go away? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of life eternal. And so we're talking about the master teacher. In John chapter 8, in verse 31, Jesus would say, If you abide in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And so, to become a learner and, and to try to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, that's no small task. No, it's not. It, it, it is a, a great task that uh, we have been given. And, uh, you know, it's one that, that we need to take very seriously as members of the body of Christ. Uh, to understand that we have a responsibility to be a disciple and then also to make disciples. I guess maybe one question we ought to ask, what would a person need to do to become a disciple of Jesus? Because we talk about discipleship and becoming a learner, but how would a person become a disciple of Jesus? Well, Jesus, in, in just thinking about Matthew 28, uh, 19 through 20, the Great Commission as we often call it, uh, Jesus lays it out for us there. He makes it very clear. Uh, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples, or teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The command there, or the verbs there are go and make disciples. And those are 
uh, imperatives. Those are commands. They're not optional. And then he goes on to tell us, and here's how you do this. Here's how you fulfill this command. You baptize them. You immerse them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then you continue to teach them all things. That right there, Jesus very simply, uh, but in a, in a way that's very concise, this is how you make disciples. Yeah, I think, you know, in that context, Jesus encouraging people of every generation to make disciples. And, of course, that would go back to the importance of preaching and teaching the gospel because in order for people to become a disciple of Jesus, they've got to know something about Him. And Jesus would say, except you believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins. And so to become convicted that Jesus is the Christ. I mentioned just a moment ago in John chapter 6, Jesus, of course, had identified Himself as the bread of life. And many of His disciples said, this is a hard saying. Who can, who can understand it? And so they, they left Him. And, and yet Peter, after affirming that Jesus had the words of eternal life, said, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Isn't it incumbent on every person to ultimately decide something about Jesus with regard to his character, his nature, his divinity? Yeah, I mean, you, you can't be neutral. Uh, you, you know, he either uh, is Lord, uh, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. There's only really three possibilities there, and, and we have to make that determination. Uh, based upon what the Scripture says. You can't, can't be on the fence as far as that's concerned. Sure. And so when we, when we talk about becoming a disciple of Jesus, you know, there are a lot of people in the world today that, that they will claim to be disciples of Jesus, but how do we know whether or not we are, we are a genuine disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, when I think about that, you know, you think about people claiming to be the Lord's disciple or, you know, they're claiming perhaps to have a personal relationship with the Lord. Um, there's something very important, and as we go through Scripture, as we go through uh, the Gospel accounts, uh, it's not about what we think as far as, okay, I feel like I'm right with God, and some people would think so, I must be. Uh, but that's not the standard. Um, in fact, in thinking about some words that Jesus said is we are going to be judged by His words. So it doesn't matter what I think. Do I feel like I'm right with God? But we need to turn our attention to what does God think about my relationship with Him? Yeah, absolutely. In, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said the prerequisite to entering the kingdom of heaven is doing the will of the Father in heaven. I, I, well, I think about a dollar bill. You know, you can have a counterfeit dollar bill or you can have a genuine dollar bill. Counterfeit might look like the real thing, but it's not. By the same token, it might be the case that some people think they are disciples of Jesus, that they are followers of Him, but they haven't necessarily obeyed His will. Jesus asked on one occasion, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So, Barry, what about obeying the will of the Father? Uh, well, obedience is uh, demonstrated in... in um in different degrees. There, there are some commands in, in the Bible, uh, some commands of Christ that are very easy to obey. Uh, and yet there are other things that, that Jesus teaches that are more challenging and require uh, more sacrifice on our part. And you know, if we think about the time of Christ, we know that He had uh, people who were disciples, they were learners, and they would follow Jesus around and Jesus would teach. But over in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, and verse 66 and following, uh, the Bible talks about how that when Jesus began to teach certain things, uh, they were really challenged by that and kind of out of their comfort zone based upon what He was teaching. And so the text says, from that time, many of His disciples went back and walked no more with Him. And so then Jesus says to the twelve, will you go also? And so <clears throat> discipleship is something that, that we're always being tested over uh, as we learn. Um, and there, there are some things that uh, people may do and assume they're disciples because uh, to them it's very easy to do. But it, it, the test of discipleship is not the easy things. The test of discipleship are the more difficult things. And so when we're, we're, we're challenged by those and, and we're obedient, 
uh, and we can continue to apply the teachings of Christ to our life, then we're, in essence, continuing to pass the test of, of what it means to be a disciple. When we talk about discipleship, one of the things that stands out in my mind is the fact that Jesus was very transparent in His teaching. There, there are a lot of folks that may have hidden agendas and maybe they will, will veil or mask some of the things that they require of individuals. But with regard to the teaching of Jesus, He was very upfront. For example, in Luke chapter 14, when the, Luke tells us that great multitudes were following the Lord, Jesus then turned and said to those people, If anyone comes to me and does not hate or love less his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And, and you talked about those sacrifices that we make, Barry. And, and quite frankly, based on what Jesus is saying, discipleship is not for everybody. Because there's some folks that are just not willing to pay the price. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, my mom or, or, or my dad, they, they've been affiliated with, certain, with a certain religious organization for many years, and, and based on that, I just can't, I, I can't walk away from that heritage. And, and so they allow earthly ties, so to speak, to come between them and the Lord. There, there are other examples, but, and, and then Jesus goes on to say in verse 27, whoever does not bear his cross and come up to me cannot be my disciple. A cross signifies death, a willingness to die to self, and, and that, that might be easier said than done. And, you know, another th thought that I had along that line is that uh, in order to be a disciple, it is going to cost us something. And I, I think it's really important, uh, you know, as we preach uh, the gospel and we teach others about Christ, that we don't, don't present it as something in which uh, uh, it's not going to require any sacrifice. Uh, I think that people need to know on the front end, you know, living the Christian life is tough. Uh, you're going to be challenged. That doesn't mean that there's not, you're not going to be rewarded, sure. but but it's tough. It, it it may cost you, it may cost you your relationship with your family. Uh, there have been people who their family have, have shut them off because they decided they wanted to obey the gospel and be a member of the one church. It may cost you your livelihood because there are some jobs that a, a Christian, one who's a disciple of Christ, shouldn't have. Uh, you know, it, it may uh, cost you some uh, recreational hobby uh, that you have because, uh, you know, you're accustomed to doing that on uh, the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. And then you, you obey the gospel and, and now you have an obligation to God to, to worship Him. Uh, and, and so there is a cost that is in discipleship. So, so with, with, with regard to that cost, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus talks about counting the cost. Yes. Do you think it's possible sometimes that, that people jump in before they've really weighed the cost? As a result of that, they, they become unfaithful. They, they fail as disciples. Yeah, there's no doubt. Absolutely. Uh, and it's interesting in, in Luke chapter 14, in leading up to that section where those great multitudes are following Jesus. Um, if, for instance, in Luke 14 verse 1 through 6, to summarize there, Jesus challenges the Pharisees and scribes on their traditions that they had about the Sabbath. So we think about Jesus is building up to counting the cost. He challenges us are our traditions something we're not willing to give up? He goes on and he challenges their pride. Is it our pride that's going to keep us from following him? And then he goes to the parable of the Great Supper in Luke uh, 14, 15 through 24, and he challenges them to say, uh, are, is anything, any excuse, anything you might offer to God, is there going to be anything that keeps you from following him? And then he ends with something that uh, may strike us as, uh, unusual at times, a great multitude following, you know, wow, things are going great. And then Jesus says something that is, you know, very striking. If you are not, if there's anything you're not willing to give up, we cannot be his disciple. So what about Christianity in the 21st century? It, th this is the me generation. And, and the focal point of life for many people is self. And so when we start talking about discipleship, you, you mentioned worship a minute ago. Forsaking some things that maybe we used to do by way of hobbies. I, I had a buddy of mine that, that loves to hunt and fish. 
And one of the real problems he had when he became a Christian was he'd been so accustomed to being in the woods or, or to being outside on the first day of the week. And so it was a real challenge for him to give that up as much as he loved it to be where he needed to be on the first day of the week. And so, so th there are some folks that they're just not willing to make those sacrifices. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like the, the commercial that was on television uh, some time ago. You may or may not remember it, but there was a man and he wanted to express his uh, devotion and love and affection for his girlfriend and her name happened to be Donna. And he's sitting in a, a, a tattoo artist's chair and he's going to have her name, you know, inscribed on his arm, uh, Donna. And so, uh, you know, as you're watching this commercial, you see the tattoo artist and he's, he's, he's writing Donna and uh, right at some point during the process, the man in the chair speaks up and says, now how much is this going to cost me? And, um, you know, the uh, tattoo artist says, well, it's going to cost you uh, $50. And the man said, but I've only got $42. And uh, there's a brief lapse in time. And the next time you see the couple, they're, uh, the man and his girlfriend are in the front of the tattoo uh, store, and she's really letting him have it. Uh, and uh, then there's a close-up of his arm, and it says, I love Don. <laughs> but, you know, he didn't count the cost. That's, right. that's the point. He didn't count the cost. And uh, so many uh, who begin to follow Christ, they don't count the cost. And, and as you said, Jesus said, uh, you know, what man is, is going to build a tower and, and not sit down first and, and, and count the cost? And so I think it's important that uh, people understand that there, there's a cost involved and we do need to, to count the yeah, cost. And you know, I, I, going back just a moment, you, you mentioned worship and I said something about that with regard to how sometimes it's difficult for people to walk away from that former life, things that they enjoyed doing on the first day of the week. But we do live in a me generation, among a me generation of people. And, and it, it seems to me that even in the context of worship, it's become more self-centered rather than recognizing that Absolutely. we're in the presence of God. If I understand Scripture correctly, there's only one person in the audience on the first day of the week. That's God. Yeah. We, we are the participants. But how often do you hear people talking about, and, I'm talk, and, and we're speaking about people who claim to be disciples, talking about, well, I want this or I like that or I didn't get anything out of this. And, and so it, it's, there, there's this sense of selfishness yeah. rather than selflessness. Yeah, what can I get out of it as opposed to what do I contribute to it? Not that we're not to get anything out of it, then right. we do, but, uh, but that's, that's not the, uh, the primary focus. But in the me generation, uh, seemingly it is. You know, it's like a, uh, a three ring circus. You know, uh, the preacher's got to say the right words, uh, just touch on the right subject. The song leader, you know, has to be absolutely perfect and everything has to be directed. And, uh, you know, the prayer leaders, uh, they have to be able to, to say exactly uh, the, the, the exact buzzwords that uh, make everyone feel good. Uh, and, and it's all for this, uh, what some would describe as a holy wow. Uh, but, but that's not what worship is to be about. Uh, well, you know, it wor worship's about God. Uh, and, and when I'm a disciple, uh, then I understand that. And, 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 I, and, I, and that gets back to what you were saying about is everyone a, a true disciple? Well, a lot of people think they are, sure. but they're caught up in the me generation. You know, it's what I want. Yeah. It's what feels good to me. It's what appeals to me. Uh, if I have that attitude, I'm not a disciple. Well, well said, well said. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay with us. When we say Churches of Christ, we're talking about the body. We're talking about the kingdom. We're talking about those who have been saved. Acts 2.47 says that God added to the church those who are being saved, and that daily. And so we are just Christians. Acts 11.26 they were first called Christians in Antioch. So there's no need to be anything but that. And since we're following the words of Christ and listening to the message of the New Testament, we're simply just New Testament Christians. That's all we want to be. That's all Jesus asks us to be.
Thank you for tuning in to GBN Live. If you have a question related to tonight's topic that you would like to have answered, please call 888-805-3390. That's 888-805-3390. You can also email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us live each week. You can send your questions through Facebook in the comment section, and we will do our best to get them answered on the air. Now back to the program. Thank you for staying with us. We are back to discuss discipleship tonight. We've had a great discussion thus far, and we want to encourage you to please call or write. We'd love to hear from you. We do have a question that has come in via Facebook tonight. What did Jesus give up for us? Well, that's a great question. Uh, my mind goes to uh, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, verse 5 through about verse 8, verse 11 or so. And it kind of goes along with what we've been talking about is this idea of, you know, the me generation, you know, wanting what we want. And in that passage in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, it tells us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then it talks about all the things that Jesus gave up for us, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. When we think about all that Jesus gave up for us, you know, Jesus being in heaven, a place where we all want to go and we don't have to deal with the pain, the sufferings of this life, Jesus was there without any of that. And he left that to come here to experience what we experience. And when we start to consider all that he gave up for us and how that he just he calls us to be his disciples to learn from him uh, it ought to make us be people who now we're not so concerned about necessarily getting what we want well those are great thoughts and you triggered a thought in my mind with regard to jesus paul said he took the form of a servant the whole concept of being a servant or some translations may say slave it is unappealing to a lot of folks. And yet, Paul identified himself in his writings as a servant of Christ. And, and as you said just a moment ago, Jesus came to be a servant. He came to serve the human family. And if we're going to be like Jesus, then we have to become a servant. And it strikes me in Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus talks about that great and final day when he would come with all the holy angels, one of the things that he emphasizes is servanthood. He said, you know, I was hungry, what'd you do? You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink, etc." And so here were people that were serving others in the name of Jesus. And, and with regard to servanthood, it's voluntary on our part, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. In fact, uh, if you think about it, uh, servanthood is rooted in the fact that we're willing to give um, our will uh, for him. Uh, if, if I might, I, I want just to share just a, a real, real short poem, if that's okay. Sure. Um, Lay it on your altar, O my Lord divine, accept my gift this day for Jesus' sake. I have no jewels to adorn your shrine, no world fame sacrifice to make. And here I bring with my trembling hands this will of mine, a thing that seems so small, yet you alone can understand that when I yield you this, I yield you all. That's good. Our will, when we yield our will to Christ, then servanthood takes care of itself, doesn't it? Sure does. Mm -hmm. Sure does. Triggered another thought in my mind, Romans chapter 12, where Paul talks about presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. A sacrifice, when placed upon the altar, was put to death. Mm. And we talk about as a, as, as a child of God, to become a child of God, we've got to be willing to die, yeah. to die to self. And, and so, and, and then to, to take up that cross, to, to as you said, uh, give, it's really the, relinquish, the, the relinquishing of our will. And, yeah. and boy, that's and, tough. And it was with Christ. Yeah. You remember when he's on the cross and, and, and he's praying that this cup might, uh, I mean, he, he, he was praying prior to his crucifixion that the cup might pass. But then what did he say? He said, not my will, but thine. That's right. And so Jesus set the example for us. He, he surrendered his will to the Father. And to be a disciple of his, we surrender our will 
to him. And didn't Jesus say the servant is not above his master mm -hmm. in John chapter 13? And so, so you're right, Jesus really, well, when Peter said that he left us an example that we should follow in his steps to, to, to really relinquish our will as, as Jesus subjugated his will, it, think about what a radical difference it would make in the church today if every person demonstrated that kind of, of mentality. Mm. Be amazing. Yeah. Look, at the, look at the church in the first century and how much they grew and how the world took note of Christians, of disciples, and how they were so different from everybody else. Uh, the impact that the church had then, if we will be those kind of people, be disciples, uh, we can have the same impact in our world today. That's right. Well, and I think when you look at their zeal, I, I, there are a couple of characteristics that stand out to me with regard to discipleship, first century disciples. First and foremost, I think they were people who were consecrated to God. Look at the life of Paul or Peter or, or, or John or others. Their, their whole lives were wrapped up in the Lord. You remember in Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, when Paul said, For Christ, who is our life. That was the focal point of life for them. And, and then I think the second thing, they were... Not, not only were they consecrated to God, but they were men of conviction. Acts chapter 4, when Peter and John were commanded not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus, what did they say? You remember? Yeah. We can't but speak yeah. the things we've seen and heard. That, that's the kind of conviction. That's the level of conviction we need today. Yeah. And, and just committed to that cause. Over in Acts 8, when they were scattered abroad as a result of that great persecution sweeping the early church, the Bible says they went everywhere doing what? Preaching, Preaching the Word. The word. Yeah. And so... Uh, humbling to think about their efforts and their zeal in, in comparison maybe to the, the efforts and zeal today. I know, and it, it, it certainly brings the, uh, the question, I think, to mind. Um, you know, we, we ask the question, is everyone a disciple who really thinks they are? And I think, you know, we can apply that to the religious world in general. But it has a specific application to those who are members of the church. Uh, is it possible that one can be a member of the body of Christ and uh, is no longer a disciple of Christ? <laughs> well, well, absolutely. Absolutely. If we cease to be a learner and, and cease to apply the things uh, that he teaches us, if, if we avoid the, the subjects that challenge us, if we put those in the background, if, we, if we're not willing to follow them. And, and so I think this is a, a very, uh, very relevant study for, for us today in the church. Yeah, you know, Jameson, you were talking a moment ago about Philippians chapter 2 and the sacrifice of Christ. What was it that motivated the Lord to come to earth and die for the human family. Well, one was to be pleasing to the Father, but secondly, because of great, His great love, well, really His love for the Father and His love for the human family, and the catalyst that, that ought to spark the drive in us, it, it ought to be love, shouldn't it? Mm, yeah. You know, Paul said the love of Christ constrains us, compels us, and, <laughs> and, and so, you know, if we genuinely, and, and look at Revelation chapter two, the church at Ephesus, Jesus said they had left their first love. And, and, and so what you said, Barry, about discipleship and the fact that we could claim to be disciples as members of the body of Christ, but if we're not learning and growing and acting like a disciple, then... Yeah, and, and John 13, verse 35, uh, you know, Jesus there says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Well, wh by, by what? He says, if you have love, love one for another. And so that's a test of discipleship. There sure is. Uh, if if we, we love our brethren, uh, you know, if we don't love our brethren, if we don't act loving, if we don't, we don't demonstrate the characteristics of 1 Corinthians 13 towards our brethren, you know, how can we say that we're truly a disciple of Christ? Now, we might have been a disciple up to a point, but uh, when we cease to learn, we cease to apply, then we can no longer claim that we're a disciple. Sir. Just something that, that, is, uh, that has helped me and I've had, uh, thankfully I have uh, good brethren and good teachers and, and good people helping me down through the years, but something that has helped me um, is don't just study this book just for the knowledge. I mean, of course, we, we want to know what the book says, but not just to be able to, to spout off information or spout off facts. Okay, well, I know that. But study this book to live it. Right. This book needs to be not just something that we 
know, and I know this bit of information, I know this information, but okay, how are we applying this in our life? Is it making a difference in the way that we live our life every day? You know, I think, I think those are great points that both of you have made, and that is the, the fact that God's Word, there, it's one thing to say intellectually, you know what the Bible says, but to have that Word integrated into our life. You remember in Colossians chapter 3 when Paul said, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And I think the idea is to allow the Word of God to find a home in your heart. And so uh, that, that is the challenge, really is. Got a question that's come in through Facebook. Please explain Matthew 19, 21. How much is enough to give up to please God? Uh, well, just, uh, just reading that passage here for us quickly. Uh, it says in Matthew 19, 21, uh, it's in the context of the rich young ruler. Uh, Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Uh, in, in thinking about this, uh, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he asks him what should he do so he can have eternal life. And Jesus goes through the commandments and he says he's kept that. So that's something that's interesting for us to notice is this was somebody that on the surface, you look at this man's life, hey, he's, he's doing all this, he, he doesn't do that, he's, he's doing this. But the problem is, is that he had let something come between him and God. And I think the lesson for us here, and as Jesus goes on to the end of this chapter, he makes the point that if there is anything, and in this man's case, it was his money, if there is anything or anyone that we are not willing to give up to follow Jesus, then that is what is going to keep us out of heaven. Great point. Jesus would say in Luke 12, take heed and beware of covetousness. A man's life consists not in the abundance of the things he possesses. And we could be covetous of any number of things, not just riches or material goods, but Barry, you mentioned a moment ago, somebody who hunts, you, know, you could become so self-absorbed and consumed by hunting that, that you forget about God, your relationship to God. That's just one example, but there are many things that could, could encroach upon our relationship to God if we're not careful. Yeah, and even things that are uh, good in and of themselves, um, relationship that we have with a spouse, a relationship we have with our children, uh, even these things, uh, if, if uh, we don't to handle those relationships properly in perspective in our relationship with God, uh, can be one of those things that we have to dethrone. Uh, the man that was uh, mentioned there uh, that Jesus said to sell all that he had, he had to dethrone riches in order to enthrone Christ. Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, as God looks down upon us, uh, you know, maybe he, he doesn't see someone uh, uh, who necessarily has a lot of uh, financial well-being. But what does he see? What does he see in your life? What does he see in the lives of those who are watching the program tonight? Uh, what is it that stands between you and God? What is it that uh, you're really unwilling to, to change, you're unwilling to, uh, to do uh, in order to be obedient to God? And uh, that right there is what you have to give up. You have to be willing to give up whatever, whatever. That's right. And that can be tough. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. It can be really tough. One of the questions we have tonight, can you explain the difference between true discipleship and one who thinks that they have a quote-unquote personal relationship with Jesus? Well, you know, a, a lot of people today, they're uh, I, just religious world in general, thinking about uh, people who would claim to be Christians today. They base uh, their relationship with God or what they, they, they think their relationship with God on either what they feel, so emotion, or maybe they base it on what somebody has told them. Uh, maybe some preacher or somebody that they uh, have placed their trust in. They take, have taken what they've said. Uh, the difference between that and true discipleship is a, a true disciple of Jesus Christ. They are going to place uh, their trust, they are going to base that relationship upon what God has said in His Word. It's not based upon what I think. It's not based on what I feel. It's not based on what somebody else has told me about my relationship with God. It is solely based upon what does God say? Am I doing what God has said? Have I done what God has said? Based entirely upon God's Word. So in light of that, if you go to Matthew chapter 7, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount 
would say in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Verse 22, Many will say to me in that day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? Jesus here talking about people on the final day, acknowledging what they thought to be a relationship with him, they had served, quote unquote, in his name, and yet Jesus would say in verse 23, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness or work iniquity, and he preceded, he preceded, preceded that by saying, I never knew you. Yeah. Uh, let me just suggest this regarding the question. If one is truly a disciple of Christ, one does have a personal relationship with Christ. Okay. And if one has a personal relationship with Christ, one is a disciple of Christ. And, and, and so, you know, it's not a matter of uh, either or. I, I think both, both, uh, both of those are connected together. Uh, I, can't, I can't claim to have a personal relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus if I'm not a disciple, if I'm not disciplining myself, if I'm not willing to do all that Jesus said. Uh, you know, the, the example of Matthew chapter 7, there were some there who were doing some things, obviously. Uh, but uh, did they have a personal relationship with Christ? No. Why? Because they weren't His disciple. That's right. That's right. Uh, so if you look, if you, if you take what, what you guys have said thus far, if you look at the life of, say, Paul, mm -hmm. Paul's life was, was really, Christ was woven into the fabric of his life. For example, in Galatians 2.20, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I think Paul appreciated, as you said, that personal relationship that he had with, with the Lord. It was grounded, it, it was rooted and grounded in, in the Word of God, but there was, there was a relationship there. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and you know, the Bible talks about how we are members of the household of God. There's a family relationship. There's a connection yeah. there. Yeah, and, and truth be, be told, every single man and woman has a relationship of some type with Jesus. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. You either have a relationship in which you are His disciple, or maybe you, the relationship you have with Jesus is you're His enemy. But it's still a relationship. Uh, and so, you know, we have to examine our life and see whether it, it's a relationship in which it's going to bring about blessings or whether it's a relationship uh, that is going to bring about condemnation as it was a, 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 uh, provided in Matthew chapter 7 in the example given. So we talk about discipleship and, and the fact that, that we are, as you said earlier in the program, to make disciples of all nations. What about how we live? In other words, how we carry and conduct ourselves before others, before the world, before our family and friends. What, what does that, first of all, say about our relationship to the Lord? And then secondly, can that be a drawing power, somewhat of a catalyst to draw others to Christ by how we, by how we live? Absolutely. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, in Philippians 1, verse 21, uh, Paul says, for to me to live is Christ. Uh, Paul, we've been talking about this tonight, his life wasn't about, he didn't say for me to live is me to do what I want to do. His life was all about Christ and thinking about uh, the effect that can have on those around us. Just a little bit earlier in that chapter, Paul said in Philippians 1, 12 and 13, I want you to know, brethren, because remember now Paul's been arrested. Paul's not walking around a free man in the book of Philippians, but he's under arrest there that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident, it has become fully known to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. There was nobody that was around Paul who did not know why he was there and who he was serving. Can you, can you imagine being chained to Paul? Th those Roman guards being rotated in every four to six hours and, and so Paul's got, you know, it's almost like a fresh candidate every four to six hours. Got somebody else to talk to about the gospel. And, you know, in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul talked about how he suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of change. But I love what he said, but the Word of God's not bound. So, you know what, you can chain me up, but you can't yeah, muzzle me. Absolutely. Well, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. 
Uh, and uh, as Christians today, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to lift him up. How do we do that? With our life. Uh, by the way we live, we, you know, kids saying this little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's what we're to do. Right. And if we do that, then to get back to your, uh, your question, it, it, it will draw people uh, because of the life that we live, because that'll be a life that they'll want to live. You know what, we've got to break, we've got to take a break, but you just, you, you made me think about something. When you, look at the, when you look at the life of Jesus, His ministry, three, three and a half years on earth, isn't it amazing the people who were attracted to Him? Mm -hmm. Wherever Jesus was, people wanted to be with Him. Mm -hmm. and, and wouldn't it be wonderful if we lived in such a way that, that rather than repelling people, we attract, you know, that people said, you know what, I want to be around them because they, they make me a better person or, or they help me, they encourage me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good thought. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Hope you'll stay with us. You may not have heard of the New Movers program. This is a program designed to reach people who are newly moving into your area. It's a way to establish first contact with new people in your community and generate prospects for Bible studies. It's inexpensive, costing only $5 per congregation and $1 per address. You see, each contact will receive a copy of House to House, Heart to Heart, and a postcard inviting them to your services. Our dresses are provided for you on a map in an Excel spreadsheet so you can follow up. You can make personal contact. You can be the first faces they see from an area church. Studies show that people are most likely to change churches when they move. Contact us today and begin using this exciting tool to save souls. The Gospel Broadcasting Network is proud to bring you GBN Live. To have your questions answered on the program, please call us at 888-805-3390. That's 888-805-3390. Please try to keep your questions relevant to tonight's topic. If you have a different topic that you would like to have discussed on GBN Live, please email your request to gbnlive at gbntv.org and we will do our best to accommodate your request. Thank you for staying with us. We are back to discuss discipleship. We appreciate your questions tonight. We are going to continue our study together. We've got about 20 more minutes left in our segment tonight. Always appreciative of the opportunity to come into your home. Please, again, feel free to call us, 888-805-3390. You can email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. We would love to hear from you tonight. We were talking about our influence, the sphere of influence that we exert in the world. But, but maybe, what about in the context of our family, our children, our, our, our grandchildren? You know, it was said in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that Timothy had a mother and grandmother of faith. And, and Paul talked about the genuine faith that dwelt in him. And so we have a responsibility to live as a disciple before our children and before our family members. And if, if we turn them off, then, you know, that's, that's a terrible thought. And so what can we do to try to be consistent in our discipleship? One thing that comes to mind in the context of the home is you have situations such as I believe was the case with uh, Timothy and, and his mother uh, in which there was an unbeliever in the home. Uh, you know, his father's not mentioned. He's just noted as simply a Greek. And there can be a tendency sometimes in a, in a household like that where uh, maybe you have a, a mother uh, and she's a member of the church and the father is not a member of the church. Maybe to make excuses sometimes and say, well, you know, if my husband would just do this or that or if he would be the leader he's supposed to be, then uh, I would have the kids at church more. And, uh, and we come up with all kinds of excuses sometimes uh, to justify our lack of discipleship. And the truth of the matter is, there is no excuse for not being a disciple. Not being a disciple everywhere we go, and that includes the home. And, uh, you know, as, as mothers and fathers, uh, we must discipline ourselves uh, in order to, to have that positive effect upon our children. In, in discussing that point, my mind, I guess the passage that, that came to mind, 1 Peter chapter 3, yeah. where Peter talks about, a Christian woman living with an unbelieving mate. And, and the beauty of that is 
that she wins this man over or she potentially wins him over not by preaching a sermon to him or teaching but rather by her conduct yeah and 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 you know he said when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied yeah. by fear yeah, and, and that's just describing her discipleship. That's right. And, and, and here, here's the thing. A lot of times we, we, we take that passage, and rightly so, we apply it to a situation where you've got a Christian and a non-Christian. But there are probably far more homes in which maybe you have a, two Christians, but one's not living like a Christian. Both are members of the church, but one's not living like a member of the church. And so that, that same principle uh, that we apply to an unbeliever and a believer being married also has application if my spouse is not living like they profess. And, and so it's very, very important in that situation that I don't uh, uh, throw in the towel as far as my discipleship. I must still continue to be a disciple. I, I need to still be at church. That's I need right. to still have the kids there. It doesn't matter whether my husband or my wife's being lazy. I need to still demonstrate discipleship in my life because that can have a positive impact upon my spouse who's yes, not can. living as they should uh, at, at any given moment in time. That's right. That's right. Uh, one of the questions we have tonight, how does a true disciple approach the Word of God when he or she studies? And, and of course, studying the Word of God is, is an imperative and it may be the case that, that among many today, we're not studying as we should. But what about discipleship and, and genuinely being a student of God's Word? Uh, something, uh, I mean, there's, there's many passages that talks about the, the benefit that digging into God's Word will give us. Uh, Romans ten seventeen tells us, uh, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 tells us that God's Word is living, it's active, it's powerful, uh, it convicts us of sin. Uh, Jesus said in John 17.17 17, that the Word of God, that is truth. So we think about digging into the Word of God, and someone has, has taught me over the years and has told me, uh, when you read God's Word, uh, slow down. Pay attention to what you're reading. Think about what you're reading. Um, it's great to have reading plans and read through Scripture. The danger with those sometimes I have found, because I have done it myself, is to, okay, I've got to read this, check that off, and so I can be on track for tomorrow. Yeah. But the problem is we've read it, and we haven't thought at all about the things that we've read. It, Absolutely. If we are going to, if we are really going to approach the Word of God as a student, as a learner, as you mentioned earlier, we're going to have to think about this and really turn it over in our mind. You know, I think that's great. I think those are some great comments because, for example, in, in Psalm 1, the Bible, the Bible talks about the psalmist who meditated on the law of Jehovah day and night. There's a difference in meditating and contemplating the Word of God and turning it over in your mind. And as you said, trying to blow through a chapter or two chapters, three chapters, so that we can, and, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with reading Scripture every day oh, yeah. in, in, in that please fashion. Do it, please. But, <laughs> but, but my point is that, that we, can, we can be so consumed with trying to get through three or four chapters a day yeah. that, that we're really not paying attention to what's being said and asking questions, how does this apply to me? How does it, how's it going to benefit me? And, and to, to just step back and to meditate. When I was in school years ago, I had a professor that said on one occasion, and he was a, he was a diligent student of the Word of God. And, and he said this not, in a, not, not to be braggadocious, but, but he was just making a point. He said, he said, I spent 200 hours studying this particular passage of Scripture. Which says to me, you know, that's an incredible amount of time to pour into one passage of Scripture, but he thought it merited that kind of study. Franklin Camp studied the Bible six hours every day. Gus yeah. Nichols, five hours a day, I think. And, and you listen to those guys. I go back and listen to their, to their lessons. I've been listening to Brother Camp recently, and, and the depth. The depth, yeah, the rich. And, and, and the things that he brings out that that, you know, a superficial student would miss. Yeah. 
But when you've been in that book every single day, a friend of mine said one time about Franklin Camp, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, you may not agree with everything he says, but I'll tell you this, you better make sure your gun's loaded before you go and talk to him because he knows what he believes. Well, how'd that come about? By meditating, mm -hmm. studying the Word of God. Barry, I'm sorry, you may have had something you wanted to add. Uh, the only thing I, I would add uh, is the importance for uh, uh, being open to what, what the Bible says. You know, you know, I think every, every person who goes to the Scriptures um, has preconceived ideas about certain things. I, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that because, uh, you know, that we, we get that from, you know, relationships we have with others, what someone has taught us, uh, what we've assumed because our church teaches such and such. But, but what we've got to be real, real careful for, if we want to be a disciple of Christ, when we get into the Scriptures, is we don't need to give difference to preconceived ideas or opinions that we have. Uh, we need to have an open mind to where we're willing to, to consider what the Scriptures actually teach. And, and I was going to give the example, you know, like of the Pharisees. You know, the, were, were the Pharisees disciples uh, of Christ? Mm, no. Uh, why? Because uh, they had preconceived ideas, they had opinions about certain things, and, and, the, and they weren't open to what the Scriptures actually taught in the Law of Moses. Right. And, and so many of the things that they embraced, uh, it wasn't what the Bible taught. And so, likewise, if we, we don't want to be a Pharisee, we need to always approach our Bible study from the same perspective. It's, it's okay to have preconceived ideas. You, you can't get away from that. But, but don't give difference to preconceived ideas over what the Bible actually teaches, because then we cease to be a disciple of Christ, and, you know, we have become a servant of ourself. Do you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, in light of what you just said, in verse 20 of chapter 5, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And then from that he launched out into a series of, of statements when he would say, You have heard that it's been said, but I say to you, and, and, you know, sometimes, as you said a moment ago, we have preconceived ideas or maybe we have been prejudiced towards a certain thing. Something has been handed down from generation to generation. We've never really fully investigated it, which I think in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is saying he's calling those people back to reinvestigate what the text really says. And, 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 and then, of course, adding, inserting divine authority with regard to his statements. But, but I think if we're not careful, we can approach Scripture like that. Yeah, there, it's, it, it happens all the time. It happens in the religious world in general. Um, it happens in the church, uh, in, you know, where we, we have uh, strong ideas and opinions and we're not open to what, you know, the Bible actually says. Or we take a, a portion of the Word of God uh, and, and we're not willing to consider the whole of what God teaches on any given subject. That's right. That's right. One of the questions that we have tonight before our time is gone how will a real disciple choose a place to worship? And, and I guess maybe in, in a broader sense, what about, what about a family looking for a congregation to worship and to serve with? What, what kind of criterion should someone look for? Well, when you think about uh, the worship assembly, I mean, there are different facets uh, involved, but, but, but one part of it is the learning, uh, the teaching that we receive uh, when we come to worship. And, you know, if I'm making choices about where I'm going to attend worship just simply upon uh, superficial issues like, uh, you know, I like the way the building looks or, you know, I want to go to a, a church that has a lot of people or, or I want to go to a church that just has a few people. Um, you know, we're really missing the boat of what it means to be a disciple. Uh, first and foremost, we need to be learners and we need to be sitting at the feet of someone who, who has respect for the authority of the Bible and who's going to present the, the scriptures to us and challenge us so that we can learn and can uh, be molded into the kind of men and women that God would have us to be. In Acts chapter 20, when Paul addresses the elders of the church from Ephesus, he told those men to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And, and as you said a moment ago, in order for a congregation to be fed, that would entail, number one, the elders making sure that, that the church is fed, but then also for the preacher and teachers to study and, and to be prepared so that they can present something that, that has some substance to it, so to speak. If the elders or the preachers 
or Bible school teachers are not disciples themselves. You don't want to be there. Great point. Great point. And thinking about, uh, you know, choosing a place to worship and as people, you know, make that consideration as they examine, uh, you know, the places around them, wherever they may be, uh, something that's very important that we need to consider uh, is the idea, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, He said, I will build my church. We go forward in Scripture and we see His church in the New Testament. And there's something that, that is very important that we do not need to miss that is found in Ephesians 5, verse 23. Uh, Paul, writing by inspiration, says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. There is one Savior, Jesus Christ, and there is only one church that he is going to save. So we had better make sure that the church that we are a part of is His church because if it is not, He is not going to save that church. That's true. And, and there are a number of characteristics that would enable us to identify the church of the Bible. Yeah. And so you've got to be sure that, that you evaluate and investigate, as you said a moment ago. One other question, what, a, what about discipleship? Would better discipleship of, of believers result in less religious division in the world today? Absolutely. Uh, in John 17, I think about uh, you know Jesus' prayer there in the, in the garden before he uh, goes to, uh, before Pilate. And there in John 17, uh, verse 20, after praying for his apostles, he moves on. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, through the word of the apostles. So he's talking about believing on him through the New Testament, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. We think about believing on Jesus through this right here. If we will go back to what the Word of God says and, and examine everything that we believe and do, do away with our preconceived ideas as much as we can and see what this book has to say, sure. then the religious division in this world would, would vanish. Yeah, it could cease. It could cease. Thought came to mind just very quickly, our time's almost gone, but if, if you were arrested for being a disciple of Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And really that goes back to how, how are you living? Yeah. Barry, how would you summarize discipleship tonight? We've got about a minute left. What, what would you say to encourage someone to strive to the best of his or her ability to be a genuine disciple of Jesus? Well, I think we, we've emphasized the fact that uh, to be a disciple of Christ, you must be a learner. Uh, and what we're talking about here is really a matter of salvation. Um, you know, if, if we're going to go to heaven, we must be a disciple. We must be a learner uh, of uh, Jesus Christ. And, and so my exhortation would be for those who are watching the program uh, tonight, uh, to strive to, to be a student of Christ. Uh, get involved in, in the local church there. Uh, get involved in Bible study. Make sure you're there every time the doors are open so that you can uh, you know, learn the Word of God and, and, and have an open mind as you study the Word of God and, and be willing to, uh, to be uh, guided by what the Bible, Bible says. But this is an important subject and uh, I, I appreciate so much uh, the selection of it and, and I personally have enjoyed being here uh, tonight with you, Mike. I appreciate you guys, and thank you for being a part of our program tonight. Hope to see you back here again next Thursday night. Until then, God bless you. This has been GBN Live. Thank you for watching.